Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. I'm Landon. And as you can tell from my decorations, this is our, I guess, pre-Valentine's Day episode, isn't it, Landon? Day before Valentine's. It is the day before Valentine's, so we'd like to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. And we'd also like to thank our frequent viewer, Zach, who always makes really awesome comments about, don't forget to decorate for the holiday, or why don't you try this with your hair? So, <laughs> No, we love Zach. Thank you so much. We think that's really great. So um, we're going to talk about a really interesting topic, uh, at least to us today, and I think to a lot of people in social media, all over podcasting, everybody has been talking about the same thing for the last month, and that is mixed messages and confusion um, in the LDS church as far as the LGBTQ community. Um, not to go into all the details too lengthy, but uh, for example, the church called a new church spokesman who ended up being um, an ally to the LGBTQ community. Um, we've since learned there are multiple same-sex couples that attend LDS wards, hold callings, take the sacrament, you know, seem to be able to participate fully. I've been on a couple of podcasts with different people, um, more conservative Orthodox Mormons who say, you know, this is an anomaly. This is not the direction the church is going. And then we've talked to other people, haven't we, Landon, who say this is a huge sign that the church is going another direction with more inclusion and perhaps someday actual same-sex ceilings in the temple. So what are your thoughts on that up front, Landon? Yeah, I, we got a lot of comments back on some of our shorts of people saying, uh, ain't going to happen, mm -hmm. no way, what are you, you know, because uh, we said that uh, it's going to happen, the church really is going to have to go that way, or they're going to lose such a big uh, part of their membership, and if there's one thing that history shown, it is that the church, if anything, is practical, they make changes when they need to, in order to accommodate the cultural uh, changes of the day, and the cultural acceptance of the day. We saw it with uh, polygamy, we saw it with blacks and the priesthood, and we're gonna see it with LGBTQ. Uh, so the question then comes up, how is that gonna look or what's that gonna look like? So what better topic for Valentine's than what might that look like in the future? Exactly, and so it reminded us of a, a wonderful essay that we had read about two years ago, maybe a little less than two years ago, that sort of went through it theologically. What would this look like to allow same-sex ceilings in the temple? So we're going to take you through that essay today and just dive into the topic. So um, I guess our first slide says, are same-sex ceilings possible within an LDS framework? And again, we're talking theologically within what is existing now, as far as we know? Um, this is a scripture from the DNC 128.18. It says, it is sufficient to know in this case that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless there is a welding link of some kind or other between the fathers and the children. So in this scripture, I believe the welding link actually refers to baptism for the dead, but we expanded that based on this essay that we read um, to talk about a welding link between all different types of people and, you know, different unions. So we are just going to take you through this. This is actually really fascinating. So the first time that we became aware of this essay that was written um, was in the Salt Lake Tribune, where we found an article written by Peggy Fletcher Stack. Again, I said this is back in October of 2022, so it's been a while. And the article is called Theological Breakthrough, LDS Scholar Seeks a Path for Same-Sex Temple Ceilings that Honor the Church's stealings, or Teachings. Um, law Professor's Approach Builds on Church Precedent, Not on a Social Agenda. So again, looking at the church's own theology to find a path for this to actually be possible. So let's read a couple excerpts from the article so you can kind of get an idea of what it's about. And then we'll actually dive into key points from the article itself. Do you want to read that, Landon? This is from the Tribune. Yeah. By studying the history of ceilings, both in real time and by proxy for the afterlife, Nate Oman, a Latter-day Saint law professor at William & Mary in Virginia, discovered what he sees as a potential theological defense for same-sex ceilings in Latter-day Saint temples that remain true to the faith's teaching. What informs ceiling practices is a basic uncertainty about the pre precise nature of eternal relationships. Ullman writes in an essay he posted earlier this week titled, A Welding Link of Some Kind, Exploring a Possible Theology of Same-Sex Marriage Ceilings, 
seen through the lens of uncertainty, there is a better way forward for the church, one that could uh, ameliorate the destructive internal contradictions in our current teachings and give to righteous same-sex couples the blessings of the temple. Exactly right. So looking at um, the church's own theology, um, this professor, this law professor, has been able to determine a possible way what what this could look like. So let's go to our and, next and slide. And I think this is important because when we look uh, at both uh, polygamy, mm -hmm. uh, getting rid of polygamy, mm -hmm. and also blacks in the priesthood, mm -hmm. we saw that for years the brethren were trying to come up with reasons or justifications of how in the case of polygamy, how they could back that off and still make it uh, align with their theology. And with blacks and the priesthood, when they were going to build the temple in uh, Brazil, and they realized that most of the people could not attend, they started looking at what are ways that we can say that, even though we've been saying forever, that blacks will never get the priesthood or blacks, uh, you know, people say, no, they said they will get it. But there's plenty of statements saying they would never get it. Right. Um, how they uh, eventually were able to theologically justify the blacks getting the priesthood and then get the revelation. And so this is a potential argument for why, here's a theological reason why uh, LGBTQ couples uh, would be allowed to be mm -hmm. peaceful. No, that's a great point. And we know there was a lot of study, especially with the lifting of the priesthood ban through the decades of how do we do this? How do we justify this given our own past statements, doctrine, theology? So again, let's start looking into it for this question. Um, also, okay, so another article that we found, not just in the, in the Tribune, but by Common Consent, this is also back in September of 2022, written by Sam Brunson, and his article says, Omen, a possible theology of same-sex marriage ceilings, and he comments about this article, and he says, Nate, this is the professor who's written the article, advocates what I will call a theology of humility. He sketches the gaps in our understanding and application of ceilings both today and through church history, how those gaps undercut an easy, our easy assumptions and why these gaps allow for same-sex ceilings. Ultimately, Nate lives by his theology of humility. While he presents his theological analysis, he acknowledges that in the end, he does not get to make the policy decisions for the church, but he makes a compelling case for why LDS doctrines of sealing and family leave plenty of space for same-sex sealings. So this article definitely, or this essay, definitely caught the attention of other people who thought this is a really interesting train of thought to go back through history and time and look at what sealings really are and what they really were is more important i think and i think through scripture as well because mm -hmm. one thing we mm -hmm. learned as we read this is the scriptures are very vague mm -hmm. on what uh the spirit world looks like afterwards in fact uh we were looking we didn't find anything uh that told us uh what the afterlife looked like in the scriptures we always had to go to uh prophet statements and right. mostly modern prophet statements right. uh, to find out what the what the theology was and that seemed to change depending on who the prophet was that was speaking at the time so. yeah and i think that's all going to be pointed out by this essay that i think we're going to go to in our next slide yes so now we're going to start taking some quotes out of this essay it's called a welding link of some kind exploring a possible theology of same-sex Marriage Ceilings, again put out back in September of 2022 by law professor Nate Oman. And we're just going to um, pull out some of his um, comments and some of his statements and kind of go through this because I think it's extremely compelling, which is why we read this like two years ago, right, Landon? And we're like, we, we, we want to talk about this. This is so fascinating. And not everybody saw it. So I think we'll just start reading through and, and then kind of see where this takes us. So um, he begins by saying, the purpose of this essay is to explore the theological possibilities of same-sex marriage ceilings in a way that requires minimal theological change and maintains maximum continuity with church practices by focusing on the limitations of our knowledge and the history of sealing practices one can see a place for same-sex marriage sealings that is true to the ongoing work of the restoration and ongoing restoration 
is a key word here, don't you think, Landon? I mean, that's yeah. kind of a newer thing. We did not hear that word until a couple of years ago. I remember when we heard it, I went, ah, here we go. <laughs> this is a way to make a lot of things possible that people may not have thought would ever happen. So this fits within ongoing restoration, meaning things are happening that we that will happen that we could not maybe even possibly conceive of now in the ongoing restoration. Well, it leaves open the possibility when they say ongoing restoration that everything wasn't restored in the first place. So we exactly. can't just say that just because Joseph Smith didn't do it, that it shouldn't be done. Uh, they're, they're saying that uh, this continues. We continue to get revelation. We continue to change. So it's uh, you, you can put this right in there with blacks and the priesthood was part of the ongoing restoration. And so would same-sex marriage uh, and same-sex ceilings would be part of the ongoing restoration. Yep, I agree. It's definitely an open door policy right there. So um, the first thing that Nate discusses are the two theories um, involving the kind of the two theories of where we are right now, I guess is how I would put it. Do you want to read this um, this part here, Landon? Yeah, the first theory is called heterosexual exaltation. And this is the process of exaltation consists in following the example of God so as to have the kind of life that he has. God, however, is not alone. Rather, we are the literal spirit children of heavenly parents. Exaltation requires that human beings enter into heterosexual marriages blessed by the sealing authority in the temple. So this is the way that we all think of right now when we think of uh, celestial sealings. Those unable to contract such marriages in mortality are promised that they will be able to contract them in the eternities. So anyone who it doesn't have the opportunity to marry here on earth if you die before you're married or uh, you simply don't find uh, the right person and you're not uh, able to marry. You're promised that uh, if you're righteous, you will be assigned uh, a, 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 a mate in the afterlife and be sealed to them and have all the promises uh, that were given to uh, to anyone else on earth. Yeah, everybody gets somebody. That's somebody, somebody yeah, gets. Some something point. for everyone. <laughs> it's very comforting, right? When you're a teenager going, oh, we, no. <laughs> we should say there's someone for everyone who is heterosexual. Um, that is same, the bottom line, yeah. Same-sex marriage is impossible under this model because marriage properly un understood is an imitation of the divine. Heterosexual union of heterosexual heavenly parents. So that is the perfect example that uh, heaven would follow. Being gay or lesbian is a moral condition, but one that will be corrected in the eternities. There will be no gays and lesbians in the celestial kingdom, not because they will be excluded by God, but because he will cause them to cease being gays and lesbians. Let's call this the theology of heterosexual exaltation. So uh, if you are gay on earth, you will be right. magically changed to heterosexual once you get to heaven and then assigned a, a, a proper mate. We, right. need... we hear this a lot. We hear this in all kinds of different, <laughs> yes. more faithful just podcasts. There, just make it to the end and you'll yeah. fix you when you get to the other side. Right. So that's definitely the first of two ways that it is looked at. And again, I would say this is split along lines of Orthodox conservative members of the church. And then the more progressive members have a different point of view. And, and all of this is coming to a head with things that are happening recently in the church. So the second theory um, might be known as eternal homosexuality, meaning sexual orientation is an eternal characteristic. Then same-sex union should be sealed in the eternities, and we must reimagine the imitation of God without the necessity of heterosexual marriage, meaning looking at that union at the top may not even be what we think it is. Um, any thoughts on that first paragraph right there, Landon? Yeah, I think it thinks that, you know, it, it, it doesn't say that God wouldn't be uh, married in a heterosexual relationship. It just allows for e eternal uh, homosexual relations as well that uh, that you could have, uh, just like on earth, that you have families that look different. You could have mm -hmm. families that look different in the eternities as well. Yep. And again, this is the second theory from an essay. Um, homosexual orientation is an eternal characteristic. This approach is intuitively appealing to many gay and lesbian Latter-day Saints. It accords with their own experience of their sexuality, which seems inherent to their identity rather than a temporary condition. So the idea that you'll be fixed someday, I think most people can't 
can't comprehend that. They're like, I'm me. Why, why would I need to be fixed? Why would I feel different? What's wrong with how I feel? Well, scripturally, that agrees with the scriptures, because mm -hmm. the scripture says the same sociality that exists with us uh, here on earth will exist mm -hmm. with us in heaven. So if you completely change the uh, uh, orientation of somebody when they go to heaven, that is not the same sociality. That's not the same uh, person. That's not the same being. You're essentially completely changing the person. And what was their purpose of coming here and having earthly experiences? If, uh, as soon as they get there, God's going to fix everything and change everything that they learned or experienced. Exactly. Unfortunately, a lot of people, um, also cling to this theory, you know, that, uh, things might change. So, yeah. And obviously this is something that is, in the future, this is not how it seemed now, but this is the theory that uh, a theory that is proposed that uh, could work uh, for allowing uh, uh, homosexual unions uh, in the yep. uh, afterlife. I think the bottom line is everybody, no one knows. And so everybody's looking at it in a different way, f informed by their either more conservative or more progressive views in the church, I think. So um, let's see, is it you? Did I just read that or did you read it? Oh my gosh, I'm getting mixed up. However, let's let you read it, Landon. Okay. So, how a big however, here we go. However, there is simply nothing in the canonized revelations of the church to suggest that homosexual orientation is eternal. Perhaps less obviously, the theology of heterosexual exaltation rests on a similarly thin foundation in the canon. The idea of heavenly parents is not contained in the scriptures. The sexualized procreative vision of divine spiritual parenthood is nowhere explicitly set forth. So this is this is very important. Yeah. We build our whole church. The whole thing is based on that we're going to be heavenly parents, owning our own planet, creating our own children, procreating in the afterlife. And yet when we read in the canon, as is shown by just about every other religion outside of Mormonism, God is single. He doesn't, there is no heavenly parents. He's got a son who, you know, in the Trinitarian view is part of God. God and Jesus is the same person. So the scriptures do not at all explicitly state uh, that there is a mother in heaven. In fact, we've done uh, some uh, podcasts on heavenly mother uh, as part of our uh, backyard professor uh, mm -hmm. series that we did. And one of the things we found, and if you want to go to the to the uh, essays, uh, the gospel Church topics gospel essay, topic yeah. essays uh, on heavenly parents, uh, you'll find that it's like five paragraphs long, and all they keep saying is, "We don't know anything about heavenly mother. We don't know what she does. We we you know they say she's single, even though we're taught polygamy that there be you know multiple heavenly mothers. So we know nothing about this ceiling." Uh, the, 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 how heaven is set up with a heavenly father and mother, heavenly mothers, heavenly fathers. We don't know. The scriptures don't tell us. So to say, well, homosexual uh, marriage is not in the scriptures. Well, neither is heterosexual marriage in the scriptures for yep. the afterlife. And therefore, we can clearly look at the scriptures, scriptures and be just as safe in saying that homosexual uh, marriages are uh, could be just as scripturally justified as heterosexual marriages in the afterlife. Exactly. That idea that we're always told one man, one woman, you know, as it says here, this is one of my favorite lines. Um, the theology of heterosexual exaltation rests on a similarly thin foundation in the canon. There is nothing there. Let's read that next scripture. Yeah, this, this, I love this, this next one. He says, rather the doctrine and covenant speaks of uncreated intelligences with no reference to ideas of spiritual procreation. So we read in Abraham, before the beginning of the world, we were intelligences. Now, the modern doctrine is, well, we, we are spirit, uh, you know, that, that God and, and Heavenly Mother procreate and have spirit children, which they then send down and put into bodies here on earth. But in Abraham, we read that uh, we always existed and that we always mm -hmm. existed as intelligences. So if we existed as an intelligence before we were created as a spirit child, mm -hmm. what form does an intelligence make? Does, it, does an intelligence have a body? What's the purpose of having a procreation if an intelligence already has a body, a spirit body? And if an intelligence doesn't have a body, how does it have gender? But yet we're told that gender is eternal. Mm -hmm. How is gender eternal if you're an intelligence? And if you're an intelligence, is it possible that is an intelligence, if you do have eternal gender, that the, 
that that gender is more something that's inside your intelligence rather than right. your genitalia, <laughs> in which case the <laughs> argument from from the uh, LGBTQ community that I don't is, feel like I'm that gender right, is correct. that exists in your intelligence as opposed to your spirit or your body. So yeah. there's a wide open section in the canon that is not explained that the church doesn't have answers to and that the church can't tell us how it works. So it exactly. could easily be opened up uh, and and any prophet can make that call mm -hmm. and say, nope, this is what that means. And the church is obligated to, uh, to adhere to that uh, interpretation. Yeah. And these are the mysteries, right, Landon? The mysteries. But I was always taught, and again, I had very orthodox parents who taught really interesting things that yes, we were intelligences, those entered into spirit bodies. So you have an intelligence that then becomes part of a spirit body. Then the spirit body becomes part of a mortal body. So it's this chain and, and the, the characteristics of what's an intelligence or what's even a spirit you know, and then moving to a mortal body, there's so much room for interpretation in there. So it, oh, there's, it is really it, interesting. Yeah, there's so many uh, problems related to that too, yes. because if you say, you know, the gender's eternal, um, you know, we we do have, uh, you know, hermaphrodites, uh, uh, the body doesn't match, uh, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's both. So yeah. did God make a mistake or is there a, an intelligence or a spirit that, that uh, conforms to that? Who, who knows? We have to then start saying, well, wait, how is gender eternal if this person, they then have to choose, you know, which gender they fall under. And, you know, in the past, you've had to make that choice. In the past, yeah. Yeah, right. now it's it's been more open up. Uh, but so how do you how do you know what gender your spirit was? So there's a lot yeah. of questions that, you know, that the church wants to tell you when it comes to heterosexual marriage with heavenly right. mothers this is way too complicated it's, we don't understand it's beyond our understanding but when it comes to gender it's black and white well there's only exactly. two and they're eternal uh no it's much more complicated than that yeah. if you're going to look at that in in spiritual ways there's all these questions that can be raised that the church has no answers for yet they don't want to say it's complicated they want to say it's black and white Exactly. One man, one woman. And we all know that model is very far removed from what's actually happening. Yes. <laughs> all right. Let's continue with the essay. All right. Temple ceilings are not what we think. This is going down this avenue was so interesting as we read this. So um, again, from the essay, when asked today to explain the significance of temple ceilings, Latter-day Saints will respond by speaking in terms of happy nuclear families. Our greatest joy in this life comes from the love of husbands and wives, parents, and children. Through sealing ordinances, husbands and wives are bound together for eternity. Likewise, by being born in the covenant or through adoptive sealings, children are connected to the eternities to their parents. Thus, the earthly joys of families are carried forward after death and into exaltation. This is how we see sealings today. This is what a sealing is. It's your nuclear family, mother, father, children, then sealed to grandparents, you know, as part of that original family. It's a nuclear family. Even that's a little problematic because people will ask, oh, wait, if I'm in their family, how am I my family? But again, the basis is always the nuclear family. You've got the grandparents, the great grandparents. So uh, this, um, according to the essay, is an incomplete description of how sealing ordinances function both historically and today, and historically is extremely important as we'll find out. Rather, they have never neatly mapped into a model of the nuclear family. So everything we're taught, everything you see in pictures, everything we read in lesson manuals, um, talks about this nuclear model that sealing is supposed to achieve. And that's not what it was, or even the goals of sealing, if we go back through history. Is that how you kind of took it, Landon? Absolutely. Uh, we always think of it as a family history chart, that pedigree mm -hmm, chart where mm -hmm. it just, you know, and then yep. it trees off and it trees off. Yep. And that that's great if everybody in your family is uh, married to one person for their mm -hmm. entire life and there's no death and nobody remarries and all of a sudden has children from another marriage. Yep. When you start doing that, you start scratching your head going, how do I fill this pedigree chart out <laughs> with this happening? Um, and so that's the reality on the ground. So you can have this Ide ideal family nuclear family tree 
But in reality, that doesn't work on anybody's tree. And that's the point that he's trying to bring up here mm -hmm. is not only does it not work now, it has never been that way and it never worked that way. And it gets even more complicated if we look at the history as than it is currently under the nuclear family uh, model that we see today. Yep, and we're going to look at the history. I know it was just recently that they changed family search when you put in information to be able to reflect a same-sex union, which that's kind of a huge step. I haven't heard people talk about that, but you can reflect a same-sex union on family search because like Landon said, that's the reality of what's happening. And you look at a pedigree chart of just the nuclear family and you can't fill it out because people are connected in all different ways. And all right, let's dig in. Okay. Go ahead with that one, Landon. Okay, this is three approaches to um, temple ceilings. Careful attention to temple practices reveals that over the course of the restoration, the ongoing restoration, as we yes. like to point out, yes. there have, broadly speaking, been three distinct approaches to temple ceilings. We can refer to them as kingdom, lineage, and family. Each era has blessed temple ceilings that depart from a model of the nuclear family. So we're going to talk about these three approaches and how they are not the nuclear family or how there are departures from the nuclear family, huge departures from the nuclear family in these different models. Right. And by approaches, I think we mean that sort of the purpose of the ceiling, how it was thought of in the day and what was it, what it was supposed to accomplish. So the first thing that we talk about in the essay are um, the 19th century ceilings. And this is where you see the focus um, on what the essay calls kingdoms. So for much of the 19th century, ceiling ordinances centered on what can be called kingdom theology. The focus was on using the ceiling power to knit together post-mortal priesthood kingdoms. The basic idea was that exaltation consisted of priesthood kingship with the goal of connecting everybody back to God as the divine king through a series of nested kingdoms created by a network of ceiling ordinances. This can be seen most clearly in the two now abandoned ceiling practices, plural marriage and the law of adoption. In all of these cases, the ceilings were less a matter of forming nuclear families than of becoming port, part of a royal priesthood network. And I remember my parents telling me about this, how in the very early days of the church, and the way they described it is that they hadn't quite figured out ceiling, right? And so they would seal, you know, the head of a family to one of the prophets or, or top leaders believing that was the only way that then you could get to the celestial kingdom. Your line had to be sealed to one of these chosen lines, and then you would all rise to the, the celestial kingdom together. So that's not a nuclear family. That's kingdom building. You need to go with that line that's already going to make it to the celestial kingdom so that your family can be there too. Had you heard very much about um, these kinds of ceilings and, and the law of adoption? I, I have, because this is exactly what they were practicing. And uh, you think of Brigham Young. Uh, we know uh, John D. Lee, the uh, person who perpetrated the Mountain Meadows Massacre, was actually uh, an a, a adopted son of, of mm -hmm. Brigham Young through the law of adoption. He was sealed to Brigham Young. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the whole intent here was that uh, you had a the person with the higher priesthood, people with lower priesthood got sealed to these people with higher priesthood and they made these networks and different higher priesthood would have different brethren uh, mm -hmm. sealed to them, which would build out their kingdom. That was one of the reasons plural marriage was that the more wives you had, the more priesthood you had because the mm -hmm. wider your network went. Mm -hmm. And so this was the original intent of this. And the whole intent was that everybody was sealed and everybody would go yeah. to the celestial kingdom. So even in this case, if you, uh, if you were, uh, a, a gay person or a gay member at the time, it, not acting on it because, uh, you know, in the words of the church, you would still be sealed to one of these networks and could right. still go to the celestial kingdom, uh, as part of this network that would go. So instead of families, you had networks of people, which was considered a priesthood network. And it had men sealed to men, women sealed to men, women sealed to children, men to their children, men to other people's children through the law of adoption. 
Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the nuclear family. It was just a wide priesthood web. And as you keep describing it, you're using words from an MLM, right? You, you want to get in someone's downline, someone yeah. who's successful. <laughs> that explains why they're so popular in LDS I think technology. so. And we should do a podcast on that, just how the whole structure is like an MLM. Yeah, but, but the idea is that everybody had to be connected, as you said, in a web so that everybody could rise together to the celestial kingdom. And so once the head of a household was sealed to say Joseph Smith, that entire downline, I'm going to use... <laughs> some MLM terms, that entire, entire downline, that man's wives, his children, everybody in his family were then safely sealed into a kingdom to proceed to the celestial kingdom. So again, nothing to do with a nuclear family. Everything was connected in a web, as you said. So that's fascinating. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that, especially the law of adoption, where a man could be sealed in adoption to another man. Extremely yeah, so this one man to one woman uh, d it has n was not the original doctrine mm -hmm. under ceilings. Uh, mm -hmm. And so anyone who tells you it is hasn't studied their church doctrine because uh, ceilings uh, existed uh, well beyond uh, just that. In fact, um, mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, the law of adoption had a similar function instituted in the Nauvoo Temple shortly after Joseph's martyrdom. This was the practice of sealing non-biologically related adults to church leaders as adopted sons or daughters. And like John D. Lee. Case with John D. Lee. Um, it's also the case with Jane Manning, who is pictured here. Jane Manning was a uh, Black woman who uh, was part of the uh, church, a uh, member of the church, who wanted to go get her temple work done and was told because she was Black that she could not. In the end, they received some sort of revelation that said they could sell her to Joseph Smith as a servant. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was sealed as a servant to Joseph Smith uh, in the temple. So that's uh, another link. She wasn't allowed to go in the temple. It was done by proxy. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, they worked out how to how to get a, a, a black slave basically into the ceiling of the kingdoms yeah. here through this law of adoption. So uh, there, that certainly doesn't sound like what we think of when we think of uh, ceilings today. Uh, like plural marriage ceilings, these adoptive ceilings referenced a family relationship, but their purpose was to extend exalting priesthood networks by providing a way of being sealed into the eternal kingdom of a high priesthood leader. So it didn't. You didn't have to get sealed to a to a wife. Uh, you had to get sealed to a higher priesthood leader. In other words, a man had to get married to, or had to be sealed to a man in order to get the uh, to, to to be part of this network. And so, in the early days, it was priesthood being sealed to priesthood. Which, since male, males are the only ones who have priesthood. Why couldn't you do that same uh, priesthood network today uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, at least with the uh, homosexual men and uh, with women, uh, you 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 could uh, seal them into the priesthood uh, through law of adoption. So, yeah, there's a lot of wiggle room there and for same sex union. And again, my parents told me when they explained, you know, this this law of adoption and sealing to the priesthood leader that they just hadn't quite figured out how ceilings were supposed to work. So it seems like there's a lot in church history that God just kind of said something and left them to figure it out, like polygamy, trying so many different things, ceiling. Yeah. But the reality is by the priesthood power, all of these ceilings exist. So if you start to picture what does the you know spirit world right now look like, there are a lot of people sealed in a lot of interesting ways to other people that don't look anything like what we're told right now. And those ceilings happened. And those, you know, and of course, we're talking theoretically in all of this, but those those ceilings happened. And there are people in the spirit world who are sealed in these kinds of unions that are very different than what we see now. Yeah. And if we hadn't figured it out, uh, you know, we if, if it wasn't clearly explained and we hadn't figured it out yet, What's to say we've completely figured it out now? Um, there's no that reason the that point. we're not still figuring yep. it out. Yep, because it's ongoing. We've just been told not everything has been restored or revealed. There's a lot left to come. So let's go to our next slide. 
All right. So then in the essay, we move forward into kind of late um, 1800s and early 1900s ceiling. And this starts to focus more on your lineage. Um, the essay says temple theology underwent a revolution in the 1890s under the direction of President Wilfred Woodruff. Most famously, he issued the 1890 manifesto, which began the process of abandoning the practice of plural marriage, meaning that multiple women are sealed in living ceilings to one man. Um, again, not one man, one woman, and not nuclear family the way it looks today. In April of 1894 General Conference, he announced a revelation ending the law of adoption. So by the end of the 1800s, both plural marriage ceilings and this law of adoption um, were ending. The prophets have said this is not going to happen anymore. Any thoughts on that, um, that bullet point right there, Landon? So if I read this correctly, a prophet received a revelation that changed how ceilings work. What? That's a unique uh, <laughs> No, you're right. Idea. That's exactly right. <laughs> Uh, two different sealing practices. He received a revelation to end the law of adoption and um, plural marriage, uh, plural sealing. So um, he counseled Latter-day Saints to research their family history and perform sealing ordinances for ancestors along family lines. So now it's being put back into the families, find and rescue your lineage, you know, by these sealings. The emphasis in this new sealing theology was on lineage, rather than kingdoms. So now with your own line, you find your own grandparents, your great grandparents back to Adam, right? That's where this all started. Um, the goal, according to President Woodruff, was to have the children sealed to their parents and run this chain through as far as you can get it. So now it's seen as a chain, a link to you personally. And I think we can all picture those pedigree charts that we had to fill out in primary and in young men, young women. So it's no longer a giant dynasty or a kingdom where your family is sealed to a network of, of church leaders. You're, you're yourself and you're sealed to your parents, sealed to your grandparents, sealed to your great grandparents, and it goes back like a chain. And I think that's kind of the church that we were born into landing with that idea. Yeah, you stayed, your, you stayed yeah. you stayed in your you stayed in your lane. You stayed in your lane. lane. That's you, right. Stay in you your downline. Your lineage. Yep. <laughs> That's it. Um, this was a new idea in the in 1894. Um, of course it was, because prior to that there was polygamy, right? There was no solid chain, you know. And and I will say, interestingly, when you go on family search and you search for an ancestor that you know had multiple wives, um, you will only find the one wife. It doesn't really list the others. You kind of have to know. It's not obvious. Like it won't show your ancestor and a list of his wives. You have to kind of dig around. So they definitely want to keep that look that it is just a chain, a single chain going back. And, and we all know that's not how it was and not how it works. Um, so the emphasis on the primacy of lineage can be seen in two ways. First, adoptive sealings along non-family lines were abandoned. As we read in the first paragraph, those no longer happen. It has to be a family member that you're sealed to. Um, when requested to do so, President Woodruff went so far as to formally cancel previous law of adoption ceilings to allow ceilings based on family lineage. So I guess that was happening. That, and that's very interesting. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. What can be bound in on earth uh, should be bound in heaven unless a prophet says it's unbound, in which case it's then unbound in heaven. Uh, so I, I guess uh, this is a little bit problematic that if you're sealed to something, uh, what's to say that uh, you being sealed to your wife today can't be undone by a prophet a hundred years from now and say, we're abandoning that. You're now unsealed and we're going to do it a different way. And now we're going to seal the husband to a husband uh, in a hundred years. That could be what we do. Uh, yeah. who, who knows? That's, but the precedence has been set that you can undo ceilings and change the way that ceilings work if you're a prophet. I know it's interesting to think of people in the spirit world who one day wake up and go, oh dear, oh now what? I've, okay, that's been canceled, so I'm no longer, okay. Oh. You know, how does that work? Where you're just kind go, of at the mercy. <laughs> yeah, you're just at the mercy. <laughs> you need to go that way. You're at the mercy of, you know, somebody on earth and what they're deciding and rescinding. It's very but, interesting. But it, it it's perfect because it fits the what was happening in the church at the time yes. because post-manifesto polygamy, oh, yeah. all of a sudden they were saying, you're no longer married to this person that we yeah. married you to. You need to go off and uh, right. create a separate family. You're not with this person anymore. Right. 
and you had to separate as a family. And so we, what we see here in the ceilings is a reflection of what was happening uh, on earth to the, uh, yeah. to the Latter-day Saints. Yeah, and that's a devastating, absolutely devastating time period of post-manifesto. Polygamy as families were ripped apart. And again, no longer one man, one woman, or even one man and multiple women. Now you're separating. The women have to go live alone. I have several ancestors in that situation that had to take children and, and leave on their own. In fact, we should make a plug. Uh, Mormonish is sponsoring a reader's theater of a wonderful play about post-manifesto polygamy. This is going to be March 17th, and we're going to put more information out about this, but um, it's a topic that people are becoming more and more aware of and the devastation and the just just the pain involved in that. And so we're going to shine a spotlight on that. So we'll get more information out about that. So sorry, I didn't mean to do an ad, but it kind of fit in. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's move on. All right. I think it's your turn to read, Landon. Still in the early 20th century. While there was an emphasis on intergenerational chains of sealing, there wasn't an effort to ensure that sealing ordinances mirrored the structure of nuclear families. Until well into the 20th century, for example, the First Presidency did not routinely use its authority to cancel marital sealings in case of divorce or remarriage after the death of a spouse. Rather, both men and women could be sealed a second time without a cancellation, regardless of gender or of how the earthly marriages ended. So uh, used to be you got divorced after a temple marriage, you could then go and get resealed to somebody and you didn't have to get the other one canceled, in which case you would be married to, uh, if you're a woman, you'd be, you could be sealed to two men. And if you were a man, you could be sealed to a woman that's uh, sealed to- Sealed to another man. To another man at the time. <laughs> and again, uh, that's not one man, one woman. And now, you know, there is such a such a process to try to get ceilings canceled. You read this all the time on, on social media. You know, they won't cancel my ceiling or this is causing me great distress. Back in the day, they just didn't do it. You could be resealed. So again, think of the makeup of the spirit world. And again, we're talking hypothetically here, full of all kinds of different ceilings. As Landon said, one woman sealed to her first husband, maybe her second husband, her third husband, all kinds of ceilings that do not reflect nuclear family or one man, one woman. The same rule was applies to posthumous temple ceilings. The result was numerous situations where men and women were enmeshed in networks of multiple marriage ceilings that did not correspond to mortal family structures, including even polygamous households. So uh, it sounds like it's a big hot mess uh, <laughs> up there in heaven with all these different people being sealed to people that they were yeah. divorced from or that they, you know, remarried because of a death, which happened a lot in the early 20th century. And now you have multiple spouses, multiple children sealed, and just everyone was sealed to whoever it was they were sealed to at the time. Uh, even posthumously, uh, you could... Uh, marry them to whoever they had been married to on earth. So uh, these ceilings just got made uh, to yeah. multiple people. And I feel like the idea might have been, and we'll talk about this later, it'll just work out. We'll uh, just work it out. I think that we'll may be an later. age old gospel yes. answer. Jesus yes. will work it out. <laughs> yes. Trust and it will be worked out. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. Let's move to our next slide. Um, still back in the earliest 20th century, talking about lineage, in the 1920s and early 1930s, when rules governing multiple marriage ceilings were tightened under President Grant, the church again did not seek to mirror nuclear families. Rather, rules hearkened back to the 19th century kingdom theology with multiple ceilings permitted to widowed or divorced men, but with a newly added requirement that women had to receive a cancellation of sealing after being divorced or widowed before a second temple marriage was possible. So I think perhaps President Grant and others started to think about this, right? And realize it, that there were uh, women sealed to multiple men. So now it's all right, kind of like it is today, for men to just continue to be sealed, continue to marry, but women could only be sealed to one man on earth. So this is this is a big change 100 but, years but later. This, this really, to me, undermines the whole purpose of a ceiling because uh, it says here uh, that, uh, that the women had to receive a cancellation of ceiling mm -hmm. after being divorced or widowed 
before mm -hmm. a second temple marriage was possible. So yeah. if I was widowed, if I was sealed to somebody and I'm widowed, I can then cancel that sealing and marry this person. What was the purpose of the first sealing? Right. The, the man who was married that, uh, that uh, died, he died thinking he was going to always be sealed to this woman right. that he was married to and that he's going to get to heaven and be on the other side waiting. Yeah. And she's going to come to the gates of heaven and come running in with open arms and he's going to open her, his arms and she's going to run to the man next to her who she yeah, actually got sealed to after she canceled the ceiling. What's the purpose of a ceiling if it's undone as soon as somebody's dead? Exactly. Uh, and, and when you can't do anything about it, when you're dead, you can't go, baby, yeah. no, please, baby, yeah. let's remain <laughs> sealed. No. And I'm making light of it and I shouldn't. But and again, what a terrible position for a woman. You love. What if you love your first husband and you want to remain sealed? What if he's dead and you meet someone else that you love? You can love two people and you want to be sealed for that person. It's not an option. You do have to then make that choice to either cancel ceilings, to not cancel ceilings. Um, of course, now more recently, posthumously, you can be sealed to more than one man if you're a woman. And we'll talk about that. But again, all these choices that you're being forced to made, make uh, theoretically, of course, we're all talking theoretically, but I can see that they're just trying to figure it out. They're almost trying to invent it as they go along based on the situations that are coming up in the time. It's like, hmm, I didn't think about that. Yeah, we better uh, look at this. Let's do yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. <laughs> Again, these, I mean, we can make little jokes here and there, but these are people's lives. These are devastating to people. And for people who really believe it, the idea of sealing being sealed to someone before children born into ceilings. Um, I know people that, that that's a, a very painful issue where somebody is, is married, the husband passes away, they remarry, the children born to the new husband sealed within that ceiling to the former. I mean, you just can't believe the pain for people that really do believe and adhere to this. So we, we can't really make light, even though it seems like an absurd situation. So um, let's see, the obvious model here was 19th century polygamy, meaning that the one man could be sealed to as many women as he wanted without breaking it. Um, and the resulting networks of the sealed relationships did not mirror, again, the structure of monogamous nuclear families. And that's, I think, what we're repeating over and over. None of these combinations of sealings or sealing practices are mirroring what we hear. The one man, one woman, it's always been that way. That's not so. It just isn't. Um, after 1934, the same rule was applied to proxy sealings. Men were to be sealed um, to all of the women to whom they had been married while alive. And again, I should say, because some of our viewers are not um, LDS, a proxy sealing means that somebody, a living person, goes into the temple and performs these ordinances in on behalf of someone who has already passed away. So a woman would go into the temple and, you know, a man would go into the temple and they would take on the name of someone who's passed away and they would do an ordinance, meaning that that couple whose names they are using in the temple will be sealed in, in the spirit world. So I know it's very confusing. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> so anyway, so men who were sealed to all the women with whom they'd been married while alive, but women were to be sealed only to their first husbands. And that's interesting and different from today. Thus, throughout the post-1894 period, the emphasis was on intergenerational continuity rather than that of a tight ritual marrying of the idea of nuclear family structure in the eternities. So because what's considered a nuclear family almost doesn't exist in reality. There's so many different ways that families are blended together that it, it just doesn't match. Well, and this this statement is ridiculous to me because it says men were to be sealed to all of the women to whom they'd been married, mm -hmm. but women were only sealed to their first husband. So if you're married to a husband and he dies and you remarry somebody who had been married to a woman who had died, the man has to be sealed to you because you're one That's of his wives, right. but you're not sealed to him. You're not sealed to him. <laughs> I didn't even think of that when I read through the first time. You're right. The man being able to be sealed to any woman he'd been married to is sealed to you. But you, if he's like your third husband or something, he's sealed to you, but you're only sealed to your first husband. I don't understand how that works. <laughs> we need further light and knowledge. That's yeah. all I can say. Evidence. All right, let's forge ahead. This is giving me a headache, kind of. Only yeah, we have I, profits to. I need a drink. I, I need. This is too much. 
Okay. All right. I think it's your turn to read, Landon. Um, now we're going to move into the mid 20th century, which, I mean, when I said that we were born into that other idea, I, I mean, I'm thinking of like our grandparents, you know, more of our immediate family, but here we probably come to us. This is probably what sounds familiar or starting to sound familiar about how we were taught about the purpose of, of temple ceilings. Yeah, this is called, this is our, of our three uh, uh, versions. This is called family. Right. After so we had World kingdoms. II, Let's just go over it one more time. Yeah, we had kingdoms, kingdoms, lineage, and now we're moving to family, which is more our era. After World War II, the church began in earnest an ambitious program of international expansion. At the center of the successful missionary message of the second half of the 20th century was the nuclear family. Uh, coincidentally, the nuclear family became big in the culture at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Leave that, it to Beaver. We moved to this. <laughs> yes. The church placed an increasing emphasis on strong marriages between husbands and wives committed to sacrificing together for the welfare of the children. The temple became central to the message that families can be together forever. This can be seen most dramatically after 1955 when the church dedicated its first overseas temple in Switzerland. Prior to the 1950s, regular temple attendance was not emphasized as a part of Latter-day Saint devotional life. Now, why couldn't I have been in the church at that point? When you, <laughs> oh, you only have to go once. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, though? I mean, we think that that's always been the focus, and we, we're told that that's the pinnacle of everything we're in the church for, but here they're pointing out in the essay that that was not really an emphasis. To, yeah. to go and to keep going. And now so we're which, building which, them everywhere all over the world where that wasn't necessarily a necessity prior because it wasn't sealing to your family. It was this priesthood network uh, of lineages. You only had to go once, you know. Exactly. And think about the role of tithing in all this, right? The church is having a lot of money problems. Think about locking down, going to the temple more often, locks down members that you must pay tithing in order to go to the temple. So it really could have sort of a monetary uh, basis well, for and, making temple attendance so important. And tying it to your family to say, if you don't go to the temple, you won't be with your yeah. family anymore is another way to do that. Uh, it, who cares if you're not uh, tied to your priesthood network in the future, Yeah, but, but you're your going to lose your children. Yeah, uh, That's a... And, that's why you always make that joke, kind of like, oh, it's a nice little family you got there. It'd be too bad if something were to happen to them, wouldn't it? You know, But it's not really a joke. That's actually what they're saying. If you don't get there and you don't pay to get there, you won't be together in the next life. So and that's that's a huge emphasis in the church at this time. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, it was common for a member of the church to visit the temple only once or twice in his or her lifetime. The international temples of the 1950s signaled an aspiration that regular temple worship be put within the reach of all Latter-day Saints, regardless of where they live. The emphasis on temple worship went hand in hand with an emphasis on eternal mm -hmm. nuclear families. Yep. So, very interesting. Yep. That's it. And I would say all the primary songs started to reflect that too, right? I love to see the temple and my family. Families can be together yeah. forever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but ooh, that was very good, Landon. But yeah, completely different from the outlook and understanding of all Latter-day Saints prior to then. So really interesting. Um, so let's keep talking about mid 20th century to the present and the emphasis on family. So with the new emphasis on temple worship and eternal families, temple worship went from an occasional to a regular feature of devotional life. The church faced a logistical challenge at this point. Now they're telling everybody to go. You've got to go, right? So what's the challenge? Um, temple work was only possible if the temples had the names of deceased persons for whom patrons can perform ordinances. So for those of you listening that are not um, LDS, in order to go to the temple, you go the first time for yourself to have those um, ordinances done for yourself. But every other time after that, you go through on behalf of a person who's passed away. So you need that name. You need to know their birthday, their name, who they're married to, because you're going to try to put back in place their family structure, even though they've passed away. You're going to try to do ordinances for, the, for this person. So now they're telling everybody to go. They need names, dang it. Um, by the early 1960s, the temples were running out of names. The church responded with the name extraction program. And this was my childhood. I have described this before. The microfish readers, my parents, 
you know, running genealogical programs, gathering names of deceased people so that other people could go to the temple. This was completely the emphasis of my entire life growing up. Um, the problem was that at a scale, at this scale, um, it was impossible to ensure that sealing ordinances followed the 1934 proxy sealing rules. So they're just grabbing names, name after name after name, scouring records. That's what indexing is today. It's no longer even looking up your own family name. It's just um, grabbing names off records everywhere, inputting them into the system so that somebody can go and do these ordinances for them. Uh, with many of the genealogical records, for example, one cannot know if a woman has previously been widowed or divorced when she was married the husband of the record being harvested. So you may come across a woman's name and she has a husband. Uh, does she have five other husbands <laughs> that she divorced or they're married? That may not be clear, but in the record keeping of the church, you simply write down the woman's name. You write down, you know, if you found a marriage record, you write down that name, put that into the system and work is done. You don't know what other work, you know, has what other family relations she had here on earth. So in 1969, the pressures led President McKay. It's always pressure, isn't it? It's always something happening that's pressure that makes them make these decisions. Hmm. Um, the pressures led President McKay to change the proxy sealing rules to allow men and women to be sealed to all of the spouses to whom they had been married in life. So that's how it is now. Even though such ceilings can create networks of polygamous and polyandrous ceilings that do not, again, correspond to mortal family relationships. So now exactly what you described before, a woman is sealed to four different men. Those men possibly were sealed to other wives having been divorced or widowed. Men are, it's cats and dogs living together, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a mess. It's a, it's a, it's a mess. mess. You got everybody sealed to everybody. Nothing looks like a nuclear family. Uh, but uh, this is the nuclear family model right here. Yep, that's <laughs> right. And the, most, the most important line, I think, is the next line here in the essay that says, when faced with a choice between mass temple work and ceilings that mirrored some ideal family structure, President McKay chose mass temple work. So instead of making sure that everybody did all the work to make sure that that name they were taking through was sealed to the right person, you know, went through, you know, all that kind of genealogical research, which is impossible when you get back a couple hundred years, there's no way you can do that. Instead of that, they made the choice. They erred on the side of, let's just seal everybody to everyone. And the famous thought, it'll just work, work out. out later. We'll just figure it out later. Instead of not having enough names for people, go to the temple because it takes too long to sort of vet the names and make sure the person is sealed to the right person and the right ceilings have been broken to seal the right person. We're just going to seal everybody to everybody so that people can continue to go to the temple in mass and we'll just work it out later. Yeah, it's amazing when you look at it from this way. It's a, it's a way that I hadn't really thought of, but that's exactly what happens is it's more important to get butts in the seats in the temple than to actually seal the families to the right people. Right, so as a nuclear the family. Case, the nuclear family. And if that's the case, then what's the purpose of all of this sealing and how important is it? And if God can work that out, it seems like he can work anything out. So. That's right. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Exactly right. All right, yeah. let's move on. Hopefully no one has too much of a headache with all these uh, connectings <laughs> and lines. But the point is, I think we're trying to make, is that nothing looks like a nuclear family. And if you were to visit the spirit world today, everybody's still to everybody because <laughs> these things have not been revoked. So, okay. Okay. Uh, this is the complexities of ceilings. Uh, and he talks about some of the ambigu ambiguity uh, associated with it. There are two sources of ambiguity. The first is the brute fact of multiple marriage ceilings that seem to imply eternal networks that do not mirror nuclear families. Millions of such ordinances have been and continue to be performed for the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. um, there are a variety of possible responses. Although its popularity has waned since the manifesto, one might affirm eternal polygamy on a massive scale. This is not theologically attractive to most contemporary Latter-day Saints and has been rejected by many high church leaders. President McKay explicitly stated that his belief that polygamy was not an eternal principle. 
<laughs> so you're now undoing the very ceilings uh, that were done and saying, no, polygamy isn't important, even though we all know it is. And even though we know that they still do polygamous uh, marriages today, that if a man, if a woman dies and a man was married to her, he can marry another woman and be sealed to her. Yep. In any case, it leaves unanswered the question of the status of multiple marital ceilings by women. We are told God loves his children and will order will order the hereafter in his infinite wisdom for their happiness. No one will be forced in the eternities into a relationship that they do not desire. And despite these uncertainties, performing temple ordinances is vital to the Lord's work. Uh, these points, while affirming the love of God and hope for the hereafter, do not provide any clear picture as to the nature of postmortal relationships. In effect, the answer to the question of what eternal families will look like is we don't know. Exactly. We don't know. And if we don't know, in an ongoing restoration, there is a room for a lot of different looks, right? Exactly. Uh, we we can see now that everything is open. Um, it, it's interesting because our book club is reading a book uh, right now called Sex at Dawn, uh, which talks about uh, <laughs> what was monogamy, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, was that the way things were from the beginning? We always hear, oh, well, it's always been a man and a woman. And uh, they talk about it, it. They talk about cultures uh, alive today where the whole village raises the children and everybody is with everybody and everybody raises the children and nobody knows who the fathers are. And that's very common in hunter gatherer or, uh, world. So what do we do with these hunting gathering societies that have no written records that we right. can't sell? We don't know the names. They're being raised as a village and as a group, not as a monogamous nuclear family. How does that get resolved in the afterlife? This is the reality for 90% of human existence on the earth where people were living in hunter gatherer tribes, not in agricultural nuclear families. Um, and then when you throw in the polygamous families, the nuclear family makes up a very small percentage of human uh, habitation. And yet we're told that this is the structure upon which the eternities and God has has built his kingdom. Uh, that just doesn't that just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. And that's a whole different episode about the idea that written records of people exist in just minutia the majority of humankind there is no written record at all so it's amazing how all this ties together because this goes right back to the uh the episode we had with dr lunwall and with thomas murphy and dr where, murphy yeah where they're both saying uh, no this temple ordinances require literate societies Fully you literate can't society, have temple yeah. Uh, these temple ceremonies without literate societies, and since 90% of the world, 99% of the mm -hmm. human uh, existence, there were no literate societies, uh, this idea becomes uh, very complex. Yeah, and it's almost absurd, actually. And I love that episode with Thomas Murphy. Here we are plugging another one of our episodes, but it was so good because he pointed out, you know, everything written here on earth is written in heaven. It's all bureaucratic right it's all you're sealed to this person and we wrote this down and it's in this book and it's all stamped with approval therefore it now isn't so everything is chaos here and there there's but so even though we wrote there. it in the book we're now going to have to fix it because yeah. uh she doesn't really want to be with him and he doesn't yeah. really want to be with her and all of these ceilings we yep. did are all just going to be people hooking up in heaven with whoever they figure is the person they want to be with for eternity after they've died and examined all of their other choices. So. Examined all their, that's a good way to put it. I like it. Yeah. And, and I think in that last slide, um, it did focus on the idea, the concept that, because it's a concern to people, you will not have to be with someone that you do not want to be with. So they've said that, but again, then that opens, opens all relationships and everything can be ripped apart, you know? No one yep. has to be where they don't want to be. So what is this focus of sealing and excluding certain people from sealings? And by that, I mean, even somebody that can't get a temple recommend, right? A, a, a mixed faith uh, family. Why exclude people from this you're excluding process? excluding people who want to be together, who are saying we want to yes. be together, and you're excluding them. Exactly. While people who are sealed and are together who don't want to be together, you say, oh, you don't have to be together if you don't and, want And you'll to. figure that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it's that wave of a hand careless, 
then why is there so much pain surrounding it here um, when it's used in a way like a weapon? You can't, you know. Anyway, we could go on and on. All right, uh, let's go to the next ambiguity, um, according to this wonderful essay. The second source of ambiguity is the diverse um, the diverse theological goals that have been offered for sealing ordinances. Like, why do we do them? Sealings, and here's a little list. So sealings have been used to create non-familial networks of priesthood kingdoms centered on high church leaders. Okay, that's one way sealings were used, as we read before. Sealings have also been used to create huge Poly polygamous households. That's exactly right. Sealings have been used to connect lines of descendants and ancestors that mirror family, if not always genetic, lineages. So that's another use of sealings. Also, sealing ordinances have been used to continue the happiness of nuclear families on earth into the eternities. So this entire list are focuses of ceilings, but they result in very different types of unions, which again, when you picture the spirit world, so many people, it's, it's kind of like how they changed the endowment ceremony. There are millions of people that made certain covenants, and then you got the next batch after they changed the endowment ceremony. Those people made other covenants. People are in different scenarios depending on where, when they lived and how they were sealed and why they were sealed and the purpose. Um, contemporary sealings rules to one extent or another reflect all of these theologies. None of them standing alone accounts for the totality of sealing practices. It is not clear that these goals are all consistent with one another. And that's true. If you look at the different reasons and the purposes, they're very different. Yet millions of people were sealed under each of these conditions. And this is supposedly God's plan for mm -hmm. how we live our uh, eternal existence. Mm -hmm. And it's been his God had the same plan and his God, yet somehow we can't seem to get it straight here on earth. Uh, and we have to keep changing how it was, how God really set it up. Uh, that's problematic. And if we can do all of these, if we can seal for all of these reasons that are listed here, why can't you seal people to uh, seal the love of two uh, men or sex. two women together? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And again, it's supposed to reflect God's union, right? So that tells me we don't know anything about that, right? Yeah, we have no idea. What, how we have God no idea. Is, yeah. Is all up. right. Let's forge ahead. This is so interesting. Okay. Um, oh, I think it's your turn, Landon. A key point. The theology of heterosexual exaltation also does not fit closely with sealing practices. That theology, recall, sees temple marriage as the solely legitimate imitation of a dyad of heterosexual heavenly parents. Right now, we regularly perform sealings in our temples that do not reflect this model of a heavenly dyad. That's yep. Nate Holman in a welding link. Yeah, and that's what we just said. Uh, many things we're doing in the temple right now, uh, where by proxy a woman can be sealed to 15 men that she was married to in the past, you know, or a man in a living uh, sealing can be sealed to all the women that he's ever been married to. None of that reflects this heterosexual couple idea of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. It's not the same. It's just not there. Yep. No, nope, it's just not there. So here it gets really interesting. Um, I'm going to let you read this line because you read this so well. These are examples of ceilings that are not at all straightforward, just examples. And I'm sure all of you can even think of your own examples, probably even from personal experience. I can think of a lot of twisted ways that people are sealed together and having to write letters to the first presidency. It was probably a lot easier back in the day where they just sounded like they did whatever. They didn't cancel things. They just went right ahead. But yeah, yeah. this is crazy. And we'll have some graphs to support um, what we're going to talk about here. But try to picture in your mind as Landon reads. <laughs> Yeah, so right now we regularly perform ceilings in our temples that do not reflect this model of a heavenly diet. Consider one example. Widowed men can be sealed to multiple spouses while living. Likewise, women can be posthumously sealed to multiple men. Uh, imagine, Joe marries Jill in the temple, and then Jill dies. In the meantime, Jane marries John in the temple, and John then dies. Jane and Joe then marry, and after their deaths, their children seal them together with a proxy ordinance. Um, such a scenario is explicitly allowed under current rules and presumably has happened numerous times. In this example, Joe is sealed to Jane and Jill, who is sealed only to Joe. And we've got a, we've got a diagram on this in just yeah. a second. Jane is sealed to Joe and John, who is sealed only to Jill. 
All of the ceilings are equally valid. Whatever else can be said about such ceilings, they do not, taken in their entirety, reflect the dyad envisioned by the theology of heterosexual exaltation. They cannot even be reconciled with such a theory by endorsing post-mortal polygamy because the multiple ceilings are symmetrical rather than asymmetrical by gender. At best, the theology of heterosexual exaltation can affirm that in some way that we do not understand this tangle of ceilings will be resolved into heavenly dyads to everyone's satisfaction in the hereafter. Although if we assume that all three of these earthly marriages were happy and successful, it's difficult to see precisely how this would happen. We just exactly. don't know. So here's a, here's a drawing of that. Uh, we've got Joe over here on the left, uh, and he is, uh, he is uh, sealed to Jill in the lower right-hand corner. Right, it while was, they were it, alive. While yeah, they were alive. A living ceiling. But so, then Jill passes away. Right. Jill passes away. So right. if you draw a line through the middle but between the upper and the lower, the, the, the man and the woman in the bottom are deceased and the man and the woman up top are still living. Uh, so Jane and John were sealed together as a living ceiling. John has now passed away. Mm -hmm. So he's on the bottom now. And as a result, Jane is single. Joe is single. They get married. They have kids. They cannot marry on earth because they're already sealed to other people. Well, now, Joe could, but Jane cannot be sealed. Yeah, Joe could, but he, he, was, he could yeah. marry. Joe could be sealed to someone who had not been sealed to somebody right. else. However, since Jane's already been sealed, he can't be sealed to her living. But right. once she's dead, the family can go and have Joe sealed to mm -hmm. Jane, in which case Joe and Jane are now sealed together. So mm -hmm. as you see, Joe is sealed to two different women, Jane and Jill. While John is sealed to only one woman, mm -hmm. Jane, however, his dear wife, Jane, is also sealed to Joe. And yeah. so this and is- And John. <laughs> yes, it's the two, to John and to Joe. Right, so to two men. In this case, we've got a woman sealed to two men, uh, which, uh, you know, this theory of one man, one woman is simply not the case. We have, uh, um, and this is allowed by current, rules, this is how uh, this would work. Mm -hmm. And so what happens? You get up to heaven and Jane has to decide between Joe and John. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't think of a more heavenly, uh, you know, episode than watching Jane choose between Joe and John and Joe and John sitting there looking at each other going, yeah, going what? what's going on? <laughs> and John turning to Heavenly Father when Jane picks Joe and says, you promised her to me. I was sealed to her. <laughs> That's right. And then Joe could say, well, Jill may not want to be with me now that I picked Jane. So yeah, it's. Yeah. So John, why don't you and Jill get together? Yeah, maybe you. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say that even, you know, and I, I think everybody thinks, okay, it's going to be one man and multiple women, you know, heaven is polygamous. That's what they think. But even that doesn't work because the women are sealed to multiple men. And yeah. within that polygamist union. So even that model, if you want to call that the Mormon nuclear family, that doesn't work. In fact, this is this is fairly simple. If we want to yeah. take this a step further. Oh, yes. Oh, here we go. Here, here we, we go. go. This is this is Joseph Smith, the the, yeah. the man in the uh, left uh, up the left hand corner there. And what we have is, uh, you know, Joseph uh, has a living ceiling with Emma, who is uh, kind of down there uh, near the bottom. You'll see Emma. He had a living ceiling with her, but he didn't get sealed to her until like number 30 or something like that. I think it was 22 or 23. 22 or yeah, 23. He was sealed so to, to at least uh, 20, 20 women. 20-something other women before, uh, before he ever got yeah. uh, And we're talking living ceilings. These are the living, temple. yes, living ceilings. Yeah. We he know that uh, if we if we take church history, Fanny Alger was the first uh, right. uh, wife that he took, and that must have been a living ceiling because, right. if you recall, uh, he kicked Fanny Alger out, and she moved to another state. She moved to Indiana, and she married a husband. Mm -hmm. So you see here on the right the proxy ceiling because – she left the church, so the family would have to do proxy sealing and seal right. Fanny to her current husband. So she would be sealed to Joseph and to the man that she married through a proxy sealing. Mm -hmm. So she'd have two husbands. Meanwhile, you've got over there on the right times 21, you've got 21 other women that Joseph married. <laughs> some before of those, Emma. Before Emma. Some of those living, some uh, proxy 
uh, ceilings. Uh, I think that they have married him to other women now uh, after the fact. Uh, you've got women uh, who he married as living ceiling women who also were married to men at the time. So they would have been, since they were sealed to Joseph, they couldn't be sealed to their husband. But after they died, they could be sealed to their husband. Right. So you have a proxy ceiling there. Um, if you look there, one of the women that uh, Joseph Smith was married to uh, was Eliza Snow. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a living ceiling. And uh, Eliza Snow, though, married Brigham Young. Uh, mm -hmm. And because she married Brigham Young, and, and, and most people don't know this, but after Joseph died, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball split up all of his all wives, wives and married them. Mm -hmm. uh, not through, uh, they weren't sealed uh, on earth, but they were uh, just earthly marriages. However, right. once they both died under the current rules, we should be sealing Brigham to all the women he was married right. to, proxy. even the ones that uh, were Joseph's wives. So we've got to have a proxy sealing there because there's a proxy sealing between Eliza Snow now and Joseph. Now, Brigham was married to 55 women. So we see uh, Brigham sealing to 55 women, and that would have been living sealings, but he probably was also... Uh, married a bunch of proxy women as well, uh, since we know that that's what they did as they were building these kingdoms. Meanwhile, Emma down here on the, you know, down towards the bottom, Joseph is killed. She marries Louis Bitterman. Mm -hmm. um, she leaves the church, however, because she was married to Louis Bitterman. Uh, we should now proxy seal her to Louis Bitterman because we seal them to every man they were uh, married to. Louis Bitterman was still, he had three other wives in mm -hmm. addition to Emma who uh, either died or divorced or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we've got to seal him to all the women he was sealed to. Uh, so that's proxy sealings. Uh, now those women uh, that got divorced from him uh, would have married another man. So we proxy sealed to them. Uh, and then to throw it all, you look over there on the left, You've got uh, Jane Manning, who was the black servant to Joseph Smith, who was sealed to her, who was sealed to Joseph Smith, not through a marriage, but as an eternal servant. So right. this cool. is the reality of what this uh, ceilings look like. Right. Uh, and this is one man's family. One man. This is Joseph Smith alone. And this isn't even, I think this is actually the tip of the iceberg because yes. we couldn't fit all the stick figures onto the slide. But if you look at all the other men that the women eventually married and they're all sealed together, this is one tiny little example, but you can see how complex it is. And in theory, all of these people are in the spirit world right now, communing with each other, all sealed back and forth. You know, one woman sealed to multiple men, men sealed to mul multiple women. None of it looks like what we're told is a heterosexual God and mother God. It, exactly. And and so it, it's understandable why somebody who is mixed up in this, uh, take, for instance, the, the previous slide, mm -hmm. it's perfectly uh, understandable why uh, Jane might come to her church leaders and say, who am I married to in the mm -hmm. afterlife? Uh, um, will I be married to John or will I be married to Joe? And if you ask that, you think that a prophet might be able to give you an answer. But in reality, that's not the case. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, let's just read this quick summation. And then we will get to that topic, which is very timely. Um, so if we think of individual ceilings as forging part of a single great welding link of which Joseph wrote, then the sprawling multiplicity of ceiling practices become less bewildering. Law of adoption ceilings, plural marriage ceilings, ceilings of marriages that end in divorce, multiple modern marriage ceilings for the living and the dead, none of these ordinances are wasted. Each becomes another connection in the great link that will weld all of the children of God together and save them from the curse of their alienation and, and mutual forgetfulness. Uh, the answer of we don't know ceases to be a dodge that leaves the efficacy and necessity of every ceiling hanging. Rather, it becomes an acknowledgement that every ceiling contributes to the welding link, even if we do not know the precise configuration of post-mortal relationships. So everything is a part of it, meaning everything that could happen in the future as far as different kinds of ceilings. It's all part of this giant welding link. Such a view need not imply the abandonment of eternal families and hope that doctrines hold out, but it does give meaning to the mass of other temple ceilings that have been performed over the course of the restoration. They too have a role in forging the welding link. The approach leaves the precise mechanics of salvation less clear 
than the theology of heterosexual exaltation, but it has the virtue of better fitting current and past sealing practices and not relying on elaborate extra scriptural ideas. So he's finding comfort in I don't know, I think, meaning that everything has a place. These do not fit into the one man, one woman heterosexual model, but they're all equally important and they all have a place in bonding everybody together, as does everything that may happen in the future. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that he that that last uh, sentence there, he ends it on uh, not relying on an elaborate extra scriptural ideas. We keep mm -hmm. hearing from so many people that, well, this is not scriptural and doctrine is based in scripture. Mm -hmm. This idea of sealing links is not scriptural. Scripture. It is not in the scriptures. You cannot find a description of all of this. When you go ask your church leader, how does this apply to me? He doesn't say, oh, well, go read Doctrine and Covenants section, whatever, to figure out how this applies to you. Uh, the closest they could probably come is DNC 132, which is polygamous <laughs> marriages. Definitely it is not, not one all <laughs> uh, nuclear family. So uh, yeah. any idea of this is extra scriptural. And as such, as many of our friends on the other side say that the uh, doctrine must be uh, scriptural, uh, then this sealing practice is not scriptural to begin with, so it's not doctrinal. Therefore, it's open to be changed at any time wow. by any revelation. That is mind-blowing when you realize that. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of people that do go to the scriptures now and try to look all this up. Please let us know what you find. It's very interesting. All right, let's go to the second summation. There you go. This brings us to the question with which we began, same-sex marriage ceilings. Against the background of the history of ceiling practices, it is not true that one needs a precise account of a ceiling's meaning in the hereafter to be able to perform a marriage ceiling. In other words, you don't need to understand how it's going to work to do a ceiling. They haven't understood it in the past. Yeah. So why, and they went ahead and did it, why do we have to understand it now? We already regularly perform sealings in the temple whose final eternal significance we do not purport to precisely understand. Indeed, the meaning and scope of marriage sealings has changed over the course of the restoration. We have not had a single model of marriage. Furthermore, the sealing authority extends to all covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations. That's DNC 132.7. Again, the polygamy <laughs> section. Mm -hmm. uh, the church has never sealed same-sex marriages in its temples, but such unions could fit under the categories of covenants, bonds, vows, and connections. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a connection if you're married to somebody. Uh, yep. in a and it's a vow. Union. You're going to be taking a vow, you know, of faithfulness Absolutely. to that person and a bond. You are requesting this sealing so that you're bonded together. Absolutely. And you've already bonded in love, which is why you're requesting the union to begin yep. with. So it yep. says that they, those are all allowed. Yeah. And covenant, you're making a covenant to each other. So very interesting. All right, let's go on. As to the precise theological status of sexual identity in the eternities, the church could say, we don't know. The church currently performs marriage ceilings where the precise meaning of the union in the eternities is unknown. But we are confident that the power of godliness, that's from DNC 8, uh, 8420, manifested in the ordinance will bless the couple and the ordinance itself forms a part of the great latter day work of creating the welding link of which Joseph prophesied. So in other words, by linking in same sex couples into this welding link, just as we did polygamous couples, just as we do divorced couples who've remarried, just as we have widowed couples, we make a great welding link of all people mm -hmm. and not just heterosexual nuclear families. Right, which is not a model as we can see in the hereafter. So this is a absolutely fascinating essay and we just took pieces of it. And so we would encourage everybody to read the essay in its entirety. We will link it in the show notes. So um, this of course brought to mind um, a talk that President Oaks gave from the pulpit at General Conference. I think it was in 2000, I want to say 19. I should have looked up the date. Early recent. And yeah, it's called Trust in the Lord. And it's a talk by President Dallin Oaks. Here I have a picture of him with his first lovely wife, 
who passed away and he has since remarried. So he himself is in one of those unions where he is now currently sealed in a polygamous union to two women. So let's now, go to this Now, it talk. should be pointed out that the second wife had never been married. So in his case, yeah. there's not the uh, the second wife being sealed to a, another man. And it's interesting that it seems that general authorities can only marry uh, women who have not been previously sealed. Yes. Exactly. So they don't create this mess. Uh, right. And they can show clean little links uh, to, to these people. Because I can't think of any general authority who has married someone who is divorced or who is widowed. Um, yeah. It's always uh, somebody who hasn't been married before. A first marriage. Yeah, I think there are a few exceptions, but but especially in the apostles, for sure. Yeah. So the talk starts out, um, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, a letter I received some time ago, again, there's always a letter, that's always suspect, <laughs> introduces the subject of my talk. The writer was contemplating a temple marriage to a man whose eternal companion had died. She would be a second wife. She asked this question, would she be able to have her own house in the next life or would she have to live with her husband and his first wife? I just told her to trust in the Lord. Now, I will say when he read that, there was laughter in the conference center. He, 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 what a funny idea. I think that letter might have been written by his second wife. This, so. <laughs> this is a real concern and a real question that a second wife has when her husband has been sealed to a, another woman. She's asking, what does the next life look like? And what are or we me. told? For me, what does the next life look like for me? And she's told from President Oaks, I just told her to trust the Lord. In other words, he has no idea, no idea. So yeah, this I'm I'm this letter made me really angry. This whole talk and the fact that people laughed at this woman. This is a reality to her, and it very well could have been written by his second wife. So he goes on to say, I continue with an experience I heard from a valued associate, which I share with his permission. After the death of his beloved wife and the mother of his children, a father remarried. Some grown children strongly objected to the remarriage and sought the counsel of a close relative who is a respected church leader. So again, the children are concerned too. Wait, dad sealed the mom. He's remarrying. What happens to us? What does the next life look like, right? Who are we connected to? Everybody's so concerned because it's so unclear. So they go to a church leader to ask this question. After hearing the response for their objections, which focused on conditions and relationships in the spirit world or the kingdom of glory that that follow the final judgment. So again, you can hear these kids saying, I don't understand. Will we be with mom and dad? Will dad be with someone else? What about this other person's children? Are they now my brothers and sisters? They're very concerned because of this focus on nuclear family, which in this case is not matching what's about to happen to their family, right? If their dad marries this other woman. So um, they say to the leader, the leader answered, you are worried about the wrong things. You should be worried about whether you will get to those places. Concentrate on that. If you get there, all of it will be more wonderful than you can imagine. So what again, we don't have any idea. <laughs> These are real questions from people that really believe this and they really want to find out what ramifications this has for them in the next life. And they're being told, you better just really try to get there. Pay your tithing and go to the temple. It'll all work out later. So how important can it really be if it will all just work out later and have trust? So what a comforting teaching, he says, trust in the Lord. Again, they have no idea. So how can they be so punitive in what they're saying now about who can and can't get sealed if they don't know what it's going to look like? And can you imagine if a same-sex couple went to their uh, church leader and said, you know, what's going to happen to us in, in the end? And the church leader says, you shouldn't be worried about that. Just make sure that you get to the right place mm -hmm. and trust that the Lord will work this out for you. Yeah. Continue that, that to is believe, what they're saying. but the Lord that is, is going to work it out. That's exactly what they're saying right now. Yeah. But in this case, these people can get married and can get sealed, but this couple can't. You're telling them, just trust in right. the Lord that he'll work it out. But then why not let them be sealed just like these people are because sealed? Because you don't know. But they're <laughs> I'm never sorry, going we're to, getting spicy. Yeah, I'm they're not <laughs> going to allow that right now, exactly. but they're going to eventually come exactly. to the point where they realize that and say, yeah, yeah we've got to, got yeah, to do this. The results this. is the same. We don't know. So if you don't know, let them get sealed. Let everybody get sealed and we'll work it out later. Trust and, in the Lord. 
And All right, next like, part of the talk. <laughs> I, I was going to say, just like the blacks and the priesthood, where they yeah. said we've got the, we've got this temple and we've got tithe paying members right. in they Brazil want to go. who can't go to the temple and take these ordinances. You've got the exact same situation with same sex yep. unions. You've yep. got these people who are there. They're paying. They're paying tithing. Yep. If you're telling they're them to legally continue, legally married. To go to Yep. They're married, they're paying tithing, and they can't go to the temple. Exact yep. same situation here. Yep. All right, let's continue with the talk. We can all wonder privately about circumstances in the spirit world or even discuss whether or uh, discuss these or other unanswered questions in family or other intimate settings. Notice that they only let you do it in family or other intimate settings. Don't exactly. do it as a group don't, outside of that. Don't do what we're doing right now. And <laughs> don't talk podcast about this. <laughs> <laughs> but let us not teach or use as official doctrine what does not meet the standards of official doctrine. To do so does not further the work of the Lord and may even discourage individuals from seeking their own comfort or edification through the personal revelation the Lord's plan provides for each of us. Excessive reliance on personal teachings or speculation may even draw us aside from co concentrating on learning and efforts that will further our understanding and help us go forward on the covenant path. This is complete opposite of what they just said. Don't worry about it. Let God work it out. But here they say, oh, don't. Th this is fun to talk about. But remember, official church doctrine is only the nuclear family. So don't go thinking about other things. But the Lord's going to work it out. But don't talk don't about it. Now. Don't discuss it. Don't think about it. Just know that the, word, the Lord will work it out if you just do what we tell you to do. Yeah. And sorry, I'm getting so worked up. I've got a frog in my throat. I'm <laughs> sorry, everybody. So that's exactly right. And again, the official church doctrine, as we just saw through the last hour and a half, it's changed drastically and it was never really official church doctrine. And the answer just can't be, we don't know, because there are people's lives. There's a lot of pain on, on all sides. And you, I just don't know is not good enough. It's not a good enough answer. And, and notice they pawned off on the members. They said, um, uh, to do so does not further the work of the Lord and may even discourage individuals from seeking their own comfort or ed edification through personal revelation. So what, you're supposed to get personal revelation of how your marriage is going to be in heaven? Uh, the church isn't going to answer it for you. You get personal revelation on that. What? Everyone could have a different answer of, oh, I'm not going to be with him. Oh, this is going to happen. Right. Or what if your revelation is, I know that my same-sex partner and I are meant to be sealed in the temple. That is what God has told me. He wants that for us, right? But then the policies in the church are saying, well, that's never going to happen. And that's exactly so, what he's leaving open. He's saying, yeah. oh, you can go have a personal revelation and feel comforted by that. But right. here's the doctrine. But you can have your own revelation as long as it makes you feel right. good. It's okay. But that's not going to happen. But don't worry about that because the Lord's right. going to work it out. <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> and again, people are laughing in this audience that even the question is brought up. But I feel a lot of times laughter at conference is nervous laughter and cognitive dissonance laughter. It's not normal laughter. So I feel yeah, like a, he's got a yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people share this, honestly. And the laughter is just kind of kind of like why you cry at testimony meeting. It's cognitive dissonance. So anyway, do we, is this the end of our talk or do we have one more? Okay, that's right. So it goes on to say, again, trust in the Lord in a familiar and true teaching in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This was Joseph Smith's teaching when the early saints experienced severe persecution and seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Again, this is President Oaks telling everybody, just trust. We don't know what's happening or what we're doing or what we're supposed to do, but trust. This is still the best principle we can use when our efforts to learn or our attempts to find comfort encounter obstacles and matters not yet revealed. Okay, not yet revealed. He said it or not adopted as the official doctrine of the church. Ongoing restoration right there. There's a little window. That same principle applies to unanswered questions about ceilings in the next life or desired readjustments. Readjustments. Hmm, these words are change words because of events or transgressions in mortality. There is so much we do not know that is only that is our only sure reliance is to trust in the Lord and his love for his children. So again, we have no idea. Yep, we're going to trust in the Lord. And that brings us to this. If this, if we can trust in the Lord to figure this out, can we trust in the Lord to figure this out? And uh, 
for those who are listening, uh, we just showed the the complicated web of Joseph's uh, marriages Feelings and proxy and marriages. And, yep. and and go to just Joe and John uh, having a living ceiling uh, of between two men. Uh, I think I think God could figure that one out too, if that's the the true uh, belief that the church has uh, in ceilings and their importance. Yeah, and we'll end with this picture again. It's President Nelson here with his. He is also in a polygamous marriage. He has his lovely wife who has passed away, and he has his current wife Wendy. So I don't know. What are the takeaways, Landon? I think we've gone through it I, again. Maybe the answer is just I don't know, but that leaves room for. Well, you can know, you can figure this out, just like they researched polygamy, how to dial back from that, just like they researched how do we lift the priesthood ban in, in our own theological model. There are ways to do it. If you look into the past, just like this wonderful essay by Professor Oman, there are ways that this can happen. Absolutely. And uh, because there it has happened in the past and because... They keep going with ongoing revelation and ongoing restoration. Uh, there's no reason it can't happen in the future. And that's what's giving people hope that it will change in the future. And that's why when people sit and say, you know, it's not going to change, don't give these people hope. That's why the church has to come out with a clear message and say, we will make this change. It will happen and give people who want to stay in the option to stay in, in a same uh, in a in the uh, in a same sex union, or the hope that they can uh, eventually be in a same sex union, because they're losing a lot of people because of this very fact that they're saying I cannot uh, stay in, uh, knowing that I, I can't participate in mm -hmm. this important blessing that the church teaches. Exactly, and it's not just the couple that wants to be married in a same sex union; it's their families who support them that finally say, "I can't." And I will point out there was a recent open house at the Red Cliffs Temple in St. George area where they opened it specifically on a day for um, an LGBTQ audience. So there were many people that attended and went through the temple, and they talked in the article about you know communing and meeting with leaders, sharing po the leaders were sharing positive messages with them. So. Again, these signs are there. Why do this? It's cruel to do that um, if there's not a there's not a window, a chance that something may be changing. So I think that's why the conservative, more orthodox Mormons and the progressives both see signs, you know, that perhaps what they hope for is going to happen. The conservatives say, that's not my church. That will never happen. The progressives say, I see signs that this will happen. So the confusion needs to end and people need to find a way forward. I think that's our message. I think so. Yeah, I think so. So what a great Valentine uh, message. Yeah, that... no, I know it got kind of heavy. <laughs> yeah. But we just thought it's so interesting in this essay. We've known about it for a couple of years and it's just so fascinating. So we would love to hear your thoughts. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts and I'm sure there'll be a lot of really interesting comments on this. But again, we're just going through some talks and some essays and some articles. I'm just trying to focus on this topic and to highlight that it may not be um, as set in stone as you think it is. So yes, please comment and let us know what your thoughts are on this. And please like and subscribe to Mormonish. Also, if you'd like to be made aware of new episodes as they come out, you can hit the notification bell. If you'd like to donate and help financially support Mormonish podcast, we really appreciate all those of you that do. It just means so much to us. And we have links in our show notes to PayPal and to Venmo. And also for our listeners or also our viewers, we have a link to mormonishpodcast.org where you can donate there too. So thank you, everybody. And again, have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Thank you so much for Mormonish. Bye-bye. Happy Valentine's. Happy to Valentine's. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.